Ahoy! Dobre ráno. That's all I know. My name is Christian Piccolini. I'm from Chicago, and I'm very happy to be here in Košice Nove Mesto. Did I say that right? Kind of? Košice. I'm here. <laughs> I've been to a lot of towns in Slovakia, and it's so nice to see all the young people who come out to the talks, because I really want to tell you about my life at your age. But first, I want to tell you just a little bit about how I started. My journey here started 22 years ago when I was 22 years old. I was the leader of America's first neo-Nazi skinhead group. But before that, I was a normal teenager with really bad hair. Like most of you, I like to have fun with my friends. I like to chase girls. There's a lot of girls here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I was also very insecure, and I had low self-esteem. I didn't know if I fit in. My parents were Italian immigrants who went to the United States in 1966, and I wasn't sure if I was Italian or if I was American. The Italian kids didn't accept me because I was too American, and the American kids didn't accept me because I was too Italian. My parents had a hard time speaking the language, but they opened a small store to support the family, and they were gone seven days a week, sometimes 14 hours a day. So maybe like some of you, I was raised by my grandparents, and I really missed my parents. I wanted them to be a part of my life, but I didn't really have that. So I spent a lot of time on the streets trying to understand who I was. I was looking for an identity. I was looking for who I was, but I was also looking for a family, a community, because I didn't feel like I had that with my own parents. But more than anything else, I wanted to do something important. I wanted to matter. Because like most of you, I had spent the first 14 years of my life in a dictatorship, my parents. They told me what to wear, where to go, who my friends could be. And I wanted to be independent. I wanted to do something on my own. So one day, when I was 14 years old, I was standing in the street, and I was smoking some ganja. Now I know you speak English. That's good. <laughs> and a man came up to me who was older than me, and he had a shaved head, and he was wearing boots. And the year was 1987. I didn't know what a skinhead was. But he came up to me, and he looked me in the eyes, and he pulled the joint from my mouth, and he said, don't you know that that's what the communists and the Jews want to do so you, they keep you calm and so they can control you. Well, I was 14. I didn't know what a communist was. I don't think I met a Jewish person. But I knew I didn't want to be controlled because after all those years of being controlled by my parents, I wanted to be my own person. So I listened to this man, and he started to tell me things like black people were coming into my neighborhood to steal, that immigrants were coming to take my jobs, and that Jews controlled the media and finance and wanted to control my life. I didn't know about these things. I didn't see them, but I believed him because he was older than me. And this man was America's first neo-Nazi skinhead. And the first neo-Nazi skinhead group started on my street in Chicago right across from where I lived. So I started to listen to this man, and he started to blame everybody else for the problems that I had, for the bullying, and for the loneliness, and for the crime. And he started to tell me that it was everybody else's fault for the problems that I was having in my life. And he promised me that I would be powerful 
when I felt the most powerless. And that's what I wanted at 14 years old. I wanted to feel powerful. I didn't want to be alone. I didn't have m very many friends. I was little. I was picked on. And my parents didn't speak great English, so people made fun of me all the time. But when this man told me that I could be powerful, I listened. And it didn't start about racism at first. It started about talking to me about being proud of who I am, proud of my culture, and telling me that if I was not careful, everybody who was not like me would take that away. And of course, I was scared of that. I was proud of being Italian, and I was proud of my family, but I didn't understand what he meant. But I learned, and I learned the racism, because I wasn't racist before. My parents were the victims of racism when they moved to the United States. It wasn't something that I understood. So I started to hang out with these guys more and more, and they started to teach me how to hate. And I would ride my little bike at 14 years old down the street, and I would buy them cigarettes, and I would go to the store and buy them beer, and they became my friends. And then a week later, I was riding my bike, and I was beaten up by three black teenagers, and they stole my bike. And that's when I learned the power of violence. That's when I started to think, this man is right. But now I know it could have been anybody who stole my bike. It could have been anybody that beat me up. But at that moment, I blamed everybody who was not like me for all the trouble that I had. One year after I was recruited, I went from really bad hair to no hair. I still have no hair. It's just, you know, <laughs> part of growing up. But I started to be violent. I started to take the anger that I felt on other people. I started to blame other people for all the pain that I had. And when I was violent on the street, it took away my pain and it put it on somebody else. So I started to feel powerful. But it wasn't real power, it was false power. It wasn't respect, it was fear. A year after I was recruited, the man who recruited me, America's first neo-Nazi skinhead, went to jail because he beat up a girl who was also a skinhead that he saw with a black man at the bus stop. He went to her apartment, he kicked in her door, and he beat her so badly that he thought he killed her, and before he left, he painted a swastika on her wall with her blood. I wasn't there that day, I was still too young to go with them. But suddenly, because he went to jail, there was no leader left. And because I had been around now for two years and I learned how to recruit, I learned how to use the propaganda to scare other people to join my group. So I became the leader of this very famous group. And I started to recruit other young people just like you, hundreds and hundreds of them. And I used the same lies that I was taught. I didn't know that they were lies. I believed them. Even though I didn't see it with my own eyes, I believed what these people told me because it made me feel strong. And then I realized that I could recruit more people if I made music. So I started a band, one of America's first neo-Nazi skinhead bands, and I started to make this music that used words of violence, that taught people through my music how to be violent and how to believe things like the Holocaust didn't happen or that immigrants and minorities were stealing and killing and raping. Again, I didn't see this happening, but I believed it. In 1991, we played a concert in Weimar, Germany. We were the first American skinhead band to leave the United States and play in a foreign country. And there were 4,000 skinheads at this concert from all over Europe, including Slovakia. And the words that I sang told people 
to be violent, to hurt minorities. And after this concert, these 4,000 skinheads went into the town of Weimar, which is a historic town that had many famous composers and artists and musicians and philosophers, and they destroyed this town. They went into pubs and they stole beer. They broke the windows of the shops, and they beat people up on the streets who lived there. And everybody was afraid because it seemed to them like it was 1933 Nazi Germany all over again. At that moment, I realized that my words, that what I said had consequences, that people would listen to my words and then go do what I told them to do. And that gave me some confusion because now I started to feel guilty about what I was asking people to do because I saw innocent people, not minorities, but white people being hurt. So the ideology didn't make sense. It started to confuse me. Why were we hurting our own people? And I realized that it was not about blaming minorities. It was just about being violent. It was about people who hated themselves, and that's why they hated other people. And that started to change me a little bit. I was already in now for about six years, and I spent eight years total. When I came back to the United States, I met a girl, and I fell in love. And at 19 years old, I got married, and we had our first child. And when I held my child in my arms for the first time, suddenly, I reconnected with the innocence that I lost at 14 years old because I never really had the chance to be young, to have fun. At 14, I did things that most adults don't do. And I felt lost. But I knew that for the first time in my life, I had something to love. And it started to push the hate out because I didn't want my child and my wife to be involved in the things that I was involved in. I knew how dirty and how hateful it was, and I didn't feel that with my child and my wife. So I started to question more what I was involved in, why I was hurting other people, and why I was spreading these lies and, these, and this propaganda. But I still was a little confused because for me, the reason I joined at first was not because of the ideology. I was not a racist. I joined because I wanted an identity. I wanted to be somebody. I also wanted to fit in to a family. I was looking for friends. And because I thought I was doing something important, it made everything else okay. And because I was confused, I decided, well, I have to support my family, and I opened a small record shop to sell white power music. I thought, if I own a business, maybe I don't have to go out on the streets and be violent anymore. So I sold this white power music, and it was so popular that it became 75% of my total sales. This was before the internet, if you can imagine that. People were driving from all over the United States to buy this music from Canada and from California and from New York. But I didn't feel like I wanted to just take money from my friends. I said, I'm going to sell other music so I can take money from my enemies. And I started to sell hip hop and punk rock and heavy metal. And when the people came in to buy that music, they were not skinheads. They were Afro-Americans, and they were Jewish people, and gay people, and Muslims. And at first, when they came in, I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't want to be their friend. I just wanted to take their money. But they kept coming back. And every time they came back, the conversation started to get more personal. And when the black teenager told me that his mother had just died of cancer, I knew that I felt the same pain 
that he did when my grandmother was diagnosed with cancer. And when the gay couple came in with their child, I knew that they felt the same love that I felt for my own child. And I began to realize that we had more similarities than differences. And suddenly, I knew that I couldn't judge a whole race or a whole religion of people based on what I had seen one person do or one news story that I read or what I'd been told for eight years. And when I became too embarrassed to sell the white power music in front of my new friends, I removed it from the store. And of course, because it was so much of my sales, I had to close the store. I couldn't support it anymore. I used that opportunity to leave the movement after eight years, after this movement that I helped create from its very beginning in 1987. And I lost everything. I lost my job. I lost my family that were my friends. I didn't have a good relationship with my real family because I pushed them away. And my wife and children left me because they were not a part of the movement and I didn't leave fast enough. So suddenly I lost everything and I had to start over. I had no identity, I had no family, and I had no purpose. And for five years after I left the movement, I went through a very hard and long depression where every morning I woke up and even though I was treating other people with respect, and my ideology had changed, I woke up and I wanted to commit suicide every day. Until one day a friend, five years later, said, if you don't change something, you're gonna die and I don't wanna lose you. And I said, okay, what's your idea? And well, she said, there's this company that I work for, they're called IBM and they're hiring, maybe you can get a job there. And I said, are you crazy? I'm like a ex-Nazi, I have tattoos, I didn't go to university, I got kicked out of five high schools, one of them twice. I don't even own a computer, why would they hire me? And she said, just try. Maybe you can tell them you're good with people. You know how to market things because of my past. I said, okay. So I wrote my first CV, my resume, and I lied because I had no experience. And I got the job. And of course, IBM is a major company with millions of customers. But where did they put me on my first day of work? The old high school that I got kicked out of twice to install their computers. I was terrified, I was so scared. And I didn't know what to do. I thought, well, I'm going to go to work my first day. This is the first good thing that's happened in my life. And they're going to fire me. They're going to say, there's that Nazi. We don't want him here. And of course, on the first day, in the first five minutes, who did I see walk past me in the hallway of the school? but the old black security guard that I got in a fight with that got me kicked out for the second time. I was shaking and I was sweating and I couldn't speak. But I decided I was gonna follow him to the parking lot and tap him on the shoulder and he turned around and this man who normally had a beautiful smile, when he recognized me, he took a step back and he was afraid. And I didn't know what to say. But I said, I'm sorry. And he stuck out his hand and I shook it. And we talked and he hugged me. May have cried, I don't remember, I think so, a little bit, maybe a lot. But he made me promise one thing, that I would tell my story because he knew that there were other young people that were going through the same thing that I was. Maybe not the ideology, but he knew that there were young people who felt vulnerable, who were looking to fit in. 
who could be given a reason to hate other people. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll tell my story. But I didn't, because I was scared. I thought that people were going to judge me on the bad things that I did in my life. So I didn't talk about it. I ran away from who I was. I made new friends. I moved. I grew my hair. I did all kinds of things, but I didn't talk about it. Until one day in 2004, I got a phone call in the middle of the night, and I found out that my brother had been shot and killed. And he was killed by black teenagers who were scared of his skin color because he was in their neighborhood and they believed because of the fear, the same fear that I had, that if somebody was different, they had to be violent. At that moment, I realized I needed to tell my story and I knew that it was important not just for kids who came from bad homes or alcohol or drug addiction or abuse, but normal kids like me. I grew up in a good home. There was no abuse. There were no gangs. There were no drugs, no alcohol. I was a normal kid who had a really promising future, and I was able to go down a very bad path. So I decided to write a book about it. And I decided to do that because I wanted to help other people that were like my brother or like me so they wouldn't make the same mistakes that I did, so they wouldn't be fooled by the same propaganda and misinformation that I was fooled by. I'm really happy and honored to announce that my book is in Slovak and it will be out tomorrow. It's being sold at newsstands all across Slovakia with the Daily Sme newspaper for one euro. And it's going to reach young people and other people who need to understand this, even adults who may know somebody who was like me. And I hope that my story will help somebody because I feel very responsible for all the people whose lives I changed. Most of the people that I knew when I was younger are now dead, or they're in jail, or they made a mistake when they were 15 or 16 years old that ruined their life forever. I was lucky. I made it out. But I know so many people that didn't. And now when they're sitting in jail, they write me letters and they say, I can't believe that I was fooled. I can't believe I thought I was smart. How could I believe the lies? I also started an organization seven years ago called Life After Hate. And these are all former extremists from the far right who for the last 20 years have been helping people leave these groups. And these are not just regular skinheads. These are all people who started this movement, who gave these lies to other people because they used them for their own agenda, me included. And now for the last 22 years, I've been helping people leave the same life that I was a part of because I understand it. I have a different idea than maybe teachers or police or counselors because I was that person and I know what I went through. Since we started the organization, we've built a network of over 200 people who are also former extremists, former leaders of those extremist movements. In this group, you'll see former neo-Nazis, former Al-Qaeda, former Boko Haram and FARC, and also street gangs from California, Chicago, and New York. And these people all realized the same thing. When we came together for the first time, we all had the same story. We were young, we were looking for an adventure, and we wanted to change the world. And then somebody found us and knew that they could shape us to do what they wanted to do because they were selfish. 
We also launched a program called Exit USA, which is a website where people can just contact us confidentially and ask for help. And we'll provide them with the support that they need to leave those groups. Because people don't join extremist groups because of the racism or because of the hate. They join because they're looking for something else, and that comes later. And there's no difference between how neo-Nazis join or how ISIS joins or how gangs recruit people. It's always about looking for young people who want answers. And they give them the answers. But those answers are not the right answers. They're selfish. I'm also honored to say that we just this week launched Exit Slovensko. And I'm working with some great, very trusted people in this country who've experienced the same thing that I did and now want to help others. Last time, this is my third time in Slovakia in nine months. And every time I come here and every time I do a talk, I leave and within a few hours I get an email from somebody saying, I was sitting in the audience or I read one of your interviews and I'm the same as you. And now I want help because I realize that this isn't something that's going to help me, it's going to hurt me and my family. I just want to talk for a little bit about what we think the far-right movement is. We usually think about skinheads or the KKK or some of these anti-immigrant groups, and there's still some of these people around, but because of the internet, because there's millions of young people sitting behind computer screens all across the world who feel like outsiders, who maybe don't have a lot of friends, or who are shy, or who don't fit in because they've been bullied, they're finding answers on the internet that solve their problems, but it's propaganda, it's lies. I can tell you this because I know the truth. I created those lies. We give people the answers that they need to feel better about themselves, but what those people don't know is that we're not telling them the truth. We're telling them things that they need to hear because we want something from them. So what used to look like this now looks like this. Regular-looking young people. Not skinheads, not KKK, but people that look like some of the girls in this audience. And they are as young as eight and nine years old. And what these young people don't understand is that the further they go down this movement with this ideology, the more they're hurting themselves because there is no positive solution. There is no way that if you're a part of this movement, your life gets better. I can tell you, it gets worse. It's gotten worse for every person that I know. I've never met one person and I've met tens of thousands of people in this movement and everybody complains that their life is terrible. And that's why they blame other people. I just want to tell you a story about a young girl from Florida who's 17 years old. Her parents contacted me because she was making neo-Nazi propaganda videos on YouTube. And they were also worried that her 23-year-old boyfriend, who she'd never met, it was an online boyfriend for six months, was recruiting her and writing the scripts for her to read on these videos. When I started to research the girl and the boyfriend, I found out that the boyfriend was not a 23-year-old guy from Idaho. He was a 35-year-old man from Russia who was doing this not just to her, but to 12 other girls. He became their boyfriend, and because these girls fell in love with this guy, they would send sometimes photographs of themselves, 
doing things that they didn't really want anybody else to see. What these guys were doing is they were using these photos and these videos to blackmail these girls when they decided to leave the movement. This is the new thing that's happening is they're targeting young girls just like you so that you can attract more boys. But I can tell you that nobody in the white power movement cares about girls. They say that they do because girls give birth to the new generation of white warriors. That's how they attract you. But when you're in, I can tell you that there is no respect for women because these men don't even respect themselves. This girl has had her life destroyed. She realized that the ideology was wrong and she wants to get out. But now these people are taking these videos and taking these photographs and every time they get reported and taken down, they just post them again and again and again. And it's happening to dozens of girls and dozens of other boys who are being fooled by this propaganda. So I would just tell you, because I think you're all of the age where I was when I was first recruited, that you can find an identity and you can find a purpose and you can find a community in positive ways. There are people out there that'll tell you, well, the immigrants and the refugees and the Roma and the blacks, they're the ones causing all the problems. But I can tell you I used to use those same words. And because I've met so many people that I once hated, I've met very few people who fit that description, who want to hurt you. The problem is, is we're so disconnected from each other that we don't understand each other. Because hate is born of ignorance. Fear is its father and isolation is its mother. When you don't understand something, you fear it. You're scared of it. And when you're so isolated from other people and you don't make an attempt to know them, it's easy to hate what you don't understand. It's easy to blame somebody else for your problems. Because if you don't know somebody, they're not real. They're not human. They're like a piece of garbage that you can throw away. But when you get to know them, you understand that what our news is telling us or what maybe some political parties are telling us or people we respect, that those people have never met the people that they hate. And that's true because I know this and I experienced this. I just want to leave you before we take a couple of questions because I know this is a short talk and I didn't tell you a lot of the personal things, but I want you to ask about the personal things. I just want to leave you with one thing. When you leave here today, try to do something nice for somebody that you don't think deserves it. Because chances are, those are the people that need it the most. I received compassion 22 years ago from the people that I hated. The people that I didn't deserve it from. When I didn't deserve it. And that's what helped change me. Making a connection and erasing that fear. When I wasn't scared anymore of what was different than me, I started to realize that we were more the same than we were different. It's up to you to change the world. I've already had my chance. Your parents have had their chance. Your teachers, they're trying to guide you. But I understand that young people don't want to be talked to. They want to be heard. It's okay to be idealistic and to want to change the world. Just make sure that you do it in a positive way. So with that, I'll just say, please go out there and make good happen. Thank you very much. I know it's hard to sometimes ask questions. Nobody wants to be the first one. 
we have a microphone, but if you don't want to use it, you can talk to somebody and they can translate for you if you want to ask in Slovak. Um, and if you don't ask questions, I'm going to ask you questions. So, Or I can let you go back to school early so you can take tests. Anybody? Yes. Okay, she asked, how is it possible that I didn't end up in jail? That's a good question. Well, a couple reasons. One, I was lucky. Two, I was arrested many times, but never spent more than a few hours in jail. I didn't get caught for the really bad things that I did because there were police officers who were also part of our ideology. And when they would find out about something, they would warn me and they would let me go. Not everybody, very few. But I was lucky. But so many people that I knew were not lucky. I know dozens and dozens of people whose lives were ruined because of what I told them to do. And I feel very responsible for that. Another question? What happened with my family? My children, I have two boys. They're 24 years old and 22 years old now. Uh, and I have a great relationship with them. They live in the same neighborhood that I live. My former wife, I have, we're friends. And my parents and family, I have a great relationship with. I was lucky, they saved my life. If it wasn't for them, maybe I would be the one who was in jail or dead now. So I, I'm so lucky that they stayed by me even when it was the hardest. So I'm happy to say I have a great relationship with everybody. Oh, go ahead. Then we'll go to you. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So the question is, during those eight years, was there a moment where I wanted to leave the group, and was there anybody who tried to help me leave? I can tell you that for eight years, I had doubts, because it wasn't how I was raised. I always had these doubts about what I believed in. in the last few years, I wanted to leave, but it was so hard for me to give up, you know, my friends and, and you know, the identity that I created, that it was very difficult. And that's why I started Life After Hate, to help people who were like me leave to make it easier for them to leave. Um, did anybody try to stop me? And I'm really sad to say that no, nobody tried to stop me. The people that tried to stop me argued with me. And that just made me angrier. They told me I was wrong. They told me I was stupid. They attacked me. But it never, it never got to me because I just got angrier. So now I know that in order to stop this, to help people who are going this way, I need to listen to them instead of talk to them. I don't argue. I listen because when I listen, they tell me the clues about what happened in their life that made them go that way. What was missing? Could be poverty, could be unemployment, could be abuse. And then I try and help them by giving them the tools that they need to make them a better person. So I find them job training or tattoo removal or education. And it's amazing what happens when people feel good about themselves. The racism falls away because now they can't blame anybody else. They have what they need to succeed. They have opportunity. Because opportunity is missing in so many places that it's easy to blame the immigrants for taking the jobs, but the truth is Im immigrants don't really have jobs either. We think that they do, but they really don't. So I try to help people feel better about themselves and get the skills and the tools that they need so that they can go be a better person and then the ideology falls away. It's, racism is a crutch. How do you say crutch? What is it? Berle? Racism is a berle. We use racism to blame other people because something is missing from our life. Go ahead.
my old friends? Okay, so the question was, am I still in contact with my old friends from those days? When I left, some of them left with me. The ones that didn't leave, some of them are still the same. But some of them over the years have reached out to me and they've said, I didn't have the courage to leave when you did, but now I need help. What can I do? So uh, many of the people that I used to know are actually, were in that picture, are part of this network, and they help other people leave now. It's interesting, you know, all these people that were in, that believed these things, now realize they wasted their lives because there's no paradise. They promise paradise, but there is no paradise. Paradise is what we make it here, how we treat each other, how we love. Because it's easy to hate, but it's hard to love. Because when you love, you risk losing something. So people sometimes take the easy way, and they hate. Yes? Do I believe in God? Wow. <laughs> Let me say this. My whole life, I grew up as a Catholic and a Christian. When I got into this movement, I left that because I didn't want to be controlled. I thought it was very controlling religion. However, after I left, I started to become very spiritual. I started to believe that there was a higher power that connected us all. But if you ask me if I believe in God, I think that God is in this room. It's about how we treat each other and about how we're connected and about what we do with what's in our head to help other people. That's God. That's Christianity, is being good to everybody doesn't matter what color, who they love, who they pray to. Everybody, as long as we do good things, is spreading the word of God. Does that make sense? Okay. And I, you know, I don't know if I'm smart enough to understand what God is. So I just try and be what I think God is. And that's just to be kind to other people. Yes, and then I'll come to you. Did someone try to kill me? Not today, uh, but yes. <laughs> In the past, I've had many death threats, many, you know, hate letters and emails and things like that. Um, but you know what? People ask me, like, does that scare you? And I, no, because... I was willing to die for something very, very bad at one time. I am willing to die for something very, very good now. And I know that I, this is my destiny. This is what I need to do to tell other people because I'm one of the only people in the world who got out who can share my story. And if I die doing that, I know that I've affected other people in positive ways. I don't want to die. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, mean, I don't want somebody to kill me. But I also know how important it is for me to tell this story, and that doesn't stop me. Yes? Oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> Skinhead, oh, she asked if skinheads want to hurt me. I said, yeah, yeah, they do. <laughs> um, but again, I know I'm doing something important, so if my life is in danger now, and people tell me all the time they're you know, going to kill me or they're going to do this or that. But you know what? It's been 22 years, and I'm still waiting for it to happen. So either they're really slow or really stupid. Any more? Yes. I like your question. Do my tattoos mean something? They mean a lot to me. It's my diary. You know how sometimes, you know, when you're young, you write a diary. Today I fell in love with Joe, and he gave me my first kiss. Well, my tattoos are like my diary. I know by looking at my tattoos where I, what I was thinking at that time, but I don't have any tattoos left from those days. I covered them up, except for one. 
I still have one. And it's this one around my arm. Most people won't recognize it because it's like Scandinavian Viking runes. But the people who are in that movement know. And I was going to cover it up, but one day, maybe six years ago or seven years ago, I was walking down the street, and a man saw my tattoo, and he said, Hey, bro, nice tattoo, white power. And I said, Hey, bro, let's talk. And I talked to him, and we talked for a long time, and I actually helped him understand that maybe what he was doing was dangerous. And I'm happy to say that that person got out of the movement. And I don't know what he's doing now, but at that moment, I was able to help him leave. So I decided to keep it. Maybe someday I'll cover it up. But for now, it's kind of a, a way for people to, to talk to me. How about something in the back? Anybody? Are these the only brave people? <laughs> Go ahead. Have I ever tried to kill someone? Wow, You're trying to get me in trouble. You know, I never tried to kill someone, but there were certainly times where I committed really bad violence. There was one time, there was one time when I was 18 years old that I was with some friends and we were drinking and we went to a McDonald's at midnight one night. And the only people in the McDonald's were three black teenagers. And when I walked in, I said, this is my bad word, McDonald's, get out. And of course they were scared because we were you know, drunk and skinheads and they ran out. And one of them, one of the black teenagers when they were running away pulled a gun and started to shoot at us but the gun broke, didn't hit anybody. But when I caught that guy, me and my friends beat him on the ground until we thought we killed him. And at one moment, as I was kicking him, he looked into my eyes. And I thought for one moment that that could be my brother or it could be my dad or my mom or somebody that I loved. And I knew that I was not just causing him pain, but that there were people that loved him at home and that they would be in pain too if something happened to him. And I felt very guilty about that. And that was the last time I committed an act of violence. And I still feel responsible for the ideas that I put into the world. My music is still in the world. And it's influencing people to this day. I planted a lot of seeds of hate. And still, 22 years later, I'm pulling the weeds that are coming from those seeds. So I know that my words and my actions had consequences. And even though I never killed anybody or never tried to kill anybody, there are people out there who listen to my words who might do that. And I feel very responsible for that. Thank you for asking that question. That's a very important question. What do I think about Trump? <laughs> First, let me say, <laughs> my words come from me. They don't represent the United States government <laughs> or anything like that. These are, this is my perspective. I'm very concerned about what's happening in the United States right now, very concerned. And I say that because 30 years ago, we started this strategy where we thought, don't get tattoos, don't wave swastika flags, put on a suit and a tie, go to college, become a politician, go to school and teach people what you know. And you know, we hoped it would happen and we didn't really believe it would happen, but 30 years later, it happened. And we have people in government, I think here in Slovakia too, maybe his name is Kotleba, I don't know. Kotleba supporter up there. <laughs> but I can tell you that I'm very concerned because what he's saying is the same thing that I said 30 years ago. That the things that he's doing are what we wanted to happen 30 years ago when we were open neo-Nazis. And it goes against everything that America, my country, was built for. We're a nation of immigrants. 
We're a nation of diversity. And that's why we've been able to do some of the really great things that we've done in our country is because of all these people. The best import that America has is immigrants. That's how we were founded. And I'm very proud of that. So when somebody tries to take that away, my parents were immigrants, right? So if somebody tries to take that away, I feel like they're destroying what America means. So I'm very concerned about that. Guys, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm honored to be able to speak to you. If you want, afterwards, if you want to come talk to me, maybe if you were too scared to ask a question, I'm happy to answer it. Um, please, if, if you're interested in my story, go buy my book tomorrow because it's only one euro. And I think that you'll be able to, to feel the same things that I felt. You'll see your story in mine and I hope that maybe you can give that book to somebody who really needs it, because I think that there are a lot of young people with questions. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day. Jacquem.